Okay, I think I've got it. All right. So good afternoon, everybody. Unfortunately, Dr. Wazen's not going to be with us today. He's uh, still over in the surgery center. So I'm going to be your only host for the first part here. Um, and obviously, as everybody's read, we're going to be talking about noise-induced hearing loss. Uh -oh, my keys don't work. There we go. Okay. So the first thing that you might want to think about is, well, why? Why would we want to care about noise-induced hearing loss? Um, and if we look at the CDC st uh, statistics, so one in four adults who actually report that they have excellent to good hearing already have some hearing damage. Um, and usually of that one in four, there's noise-induced hearing loss in quite a few of them. Right now, it's estimated that about 40 million US adults between 20 and 69 have noise-induced hearing loss, with only about 20 million of those actually coming from a noisy job where the exposure is likely. So that means that the other part really come from our recreational activities or activities that we choose to do for ourselves. Um, as a fun fact, New Jersey actually has the lowest reported rates of hearing loss and West Virginia actually has the highest rates. So what that kind of wants us to look at from a societal standpoint is there's a lot of expenses related to hearing aids and cochlear implants and just about anything else to do with hearing loss. It's actually the third most common chronic physical condition in the United States, which makes it twice as prevalent as having diabetes or as having cancer. Um, the economic cost to society is about $297,000 for the lifetime of every affected person. Um, and the people who have hearing loss are more likely to have lower employment rates or be underemployed, fewer worker opportunities, higher healthcare costs, and more likely to have low income. Um, and sadly, this number is going to grow. Nationally, the total cost of first-year hearing loss treatment is projected to multiply five times between 2002 and 2030, from 8.2 to 51.4 billion. So it's a huge societal cost for us as well. And when we think about hearing loss, it's not just the hearing loss itself that affects an individual. It's also the stress that goes into it, the anxiety. The insomnia that some people experience even after their noise exposure stops, the high blood pressure, the increased heart rate, feelings of isolation, depression, and tinnitus are all things that somebody who has noise exposure can also experience. So the first common and the most obvious when we think about noise-induced hearing loss is usually people who work in a loud uh, work environment. So, you know, factory settings, construction, um, truck drivers or people who fly airplanes, musicians, all of those places or positions, I should say, are the ones that we think people are most likely to experience the noise-induced hearing loss. And there is some truth to that. But we also usually make choices recreationally where we get exposed to loud noises. So when we think about concert venues, our different modes of transportation, at this point, the wide world is really open. You know, we have air travel, we have cruises, we have trucks, trains, everything to take us from point A to point B. Um, we have theme parks. Florida here especially has quite a few. Um, and even things just as simple as going out to dinner. Some restaurants can be quite loud. And I'm willing to bet that everybody who's on here has probably complained at least once that they were in a restaurant where they couldn't hear because it was so loud. Um, and the final thing that we have to think about is people who do hunting or shooting as an extra, uh, extra activity, because even those indoor shooting ranges can be quite loud. And when we think about a noise exposure, it can be something that's daily or something that we do fairly frequently, or even something that's occasional that can lead to these exposures. So some everyday activities, um, streaming music, from smartphones and personal listening devices is probably the biggest one, which we'll get to that later on. Um, fitness classes, if you've taken a spin class or a Zumba class, they're extremely loud. Even some children's toys can be very, very loud and annoying on top of that for most of us. Um, events, like we talked about, so concerts, restaurants, bars, sporting events are a big one, football, hockey, soccer, 
uh, motorized sports, NASCAR and monster truck shows. Um, and sometimes even movie theaters can be quite loud, especially if you're sitting right next to the speakers. And then even some things such as power tools and leaf blowers that we use occasionally, um, even they can reach pretty high levels that we're gonna discuss later on. So circling back to what I said about the personal listening devices, in 2008, mobile phones were reported to be the most popular listening device. So this is iPods, iPads, laptops, MP3 players on top of that. And the problem with that is that they average on, on their high end about 115 decibels. And later on, we're gonna talk about how long you can really afford to be exposed to a sound before it could potentially damage your hearing. But that's a lot. So when Nielsen did a study back in 2017 to see just how many people use different devices for listening to music, we can see on the graph here that smartphones are what almost 45% of people use. And the problem with that is, especially at this point in time, people are using um, the little Apple AirPods in their ears. Well, when you do that, it's lined up directly with the eardrum. You're taking a lot more force to your eardrums and getting a lot more sound than if you just had your phone, say, on speakerphone or if you were using some sort of headphones. Um, and and that even carries on to the next thing, which is PC and laptops. Usually people will use the speaker out of the computer. Doesn't get too terribly loud, no big deal, but some people hook them up to speakers that are much more powerful than they were originally designed to be. Um, and things like this do damage our hearing, whether or not we wanna be aware of it. So the highest risk group is actually adolescents and young adults. So 12 to 19 or 19 to 39 in some cases, with a stronger prevalence in males because they have a tendency to listen to music at a louder level, about seven dB louder than women tend to. And when studies have looked at why, they have found that loud music is usually used to cope with issues that develop throughout youth. Um, there's preference for listening to loud music. And frankly, when we're younger, we think we're invincible. We say nothing's gonna stop us. So we're gonna do what we want until the comes time to pay the piper. So on this screen here, we have what's called a sound level chart in decibels. So a decibel is a unit of intensity of a sound signal comparing it to a given level on a logarithmic scale. In layman's terms, it's a degree of loudness. So starting all the way from zero, which is the minimum threshold of what somebody can hear, going all the way up to 150, which would be hearing a firework. Those are extremely loud sounds. And near that top, you can actually see right there that 115 that we talked about before is where the cell phones sit. So they're getting up there on that high end for loud sounds. Now, for quite a while, there's actually been what's considered to be noise exposure limits, which was set forth by the Occupational Safety and Health Association in terms of how long you could be exposed to a certain level of sound. So if we look there at the very top for eight hours, we can tolerate about 85 dB of sound. So in most cases, that's where they're going to have factories or um, uh, aviation and things like that, they're going to have their cap for eight hours as the most that you can do in that environment. But as we go just a little bit louder to 90, now you can only tolerate 40 or excuse me, four hours before you run the risk of noise damage. We go to 95, you can be in that environment for two hours before you run that risk. And already at one hour, we're at 100 dB. So if you think back to what we said about the cap for the phones, if you look down on that chart, 115 is only about seven and a half minutes that you can really risk listening to it that loudly before you run the risk of damaging your hearing. So when we talk about noise-induced hearing loss, we wanna think about the definition. So this is a hearing loss that um, comes from damage to the structures or nerves to the inner ear that respond to sound. So it's usually caused by exposure to excessively loud sounds. 
Now this can be a one-time exposure, um, a very sudden exposure, for example, just a, a really loud pop, um, or it can be listening to loud sounds over an extended period of time, such as music. And the big problem with this is it cannot be medically or surgically corrected. So anybody who has hearing aids or has implants can tell you it's not like putting glasses on. It's the best that we can make, but nothing is as great as a perfectly healthy ear. So when we talk about the transmission of sound, sound travels to the outer ear, through the eardrum, through the bones of our middle ear, through the cochlear hair cells, to the auditory nerve, and then on up to the brain. So there's a lot that goes on for us to be able to hear the sound. But what takes the brunt of the sound is the hair cells, which code all of the different pitches that we hear. So on the left-hand side, you can see a set of hair cells that are in a perfect little V shape in three different rows. So those are normal, happy, healthy hair cells doing everything that they're supposed to be. The hair cells on the right represent hair cells that have been exposed to a lot of loud noises. If you look at that first row in particular, you can see a lot of them have folded over. They're pretty damaged they're not going to be transmitting sound as appropriately as they're supposed to be. We don't get to regrow these hair cells, at least not yet. So it's very, very important that we keep them as healthy as we possibly can. So the next thing that you probably think about is, well, what does it sound like if you have noise-induced hearing loss? So some of the most common descript descriptions can be that higher pitch sounds are much harder to hear than lower pitch sounds. The degree of hearing is usually about the same in both ears, no big difference unless you're in specific situations that may create a difference, such as being a pilot. You may feel that people are mumbling more than they used to. And you'll probably notice that it's really hard to differentiate different words. So the words shell versus cell versus fell may be harder to tell. And when you come in to get your hearing checked, you're going to have your hearing assessed on what's called an audiogram. So looking on the left side of the screen, there's the different classes or levels of hearing loss descriptors that we use overlaid on an audiogram. So if we look at the very, very top, an audiogram is always going to be done with low pitches on the left-hand side, going all the way up to high pitches on the right-hand side. And going down the left-hand side is going to be how loud something has to be for us to hear it using those decibel levels. So if we look at the chart, between negative 10 and 20 is what's considered the range for normal hearing. So 25 to 40 is considered a mild loss. 41 to 55 is moderate, 56 to 70 is moderately severe, and 71 to 90 is considered severe hearing loss, with anything above 90 being a, what's considered a profound hearing loss. And then if we look on the right-hand side, we see some of those loud sounds that we saw in one of the other charts superimposed on the audiogram. So if you look at 120 decibels, the very bottom, you see things like the jackhammer, a shotgun, an airplane, helicopter. All of these sounds are incredibly loud. Now, noise-induced hearing loss builds over time. So typically, people will start off with a configuration that's pretty similar to the one that's on the left-hand side of the screen. So the hearing's mostly normal, but we see what's called a noise notch at what's considered to be four kilohertz, which is a, a pitch that's very susceptible to noise exposure. And if we look at the image on the right, we see how that hearing changes over time. So in this particular chart, it's done in 10 year increments with the first one being 20 years of age, the second one being 30, the next one being 40, 50, and so on. So it does build over time. Just because you were exposed once doesn't necessarily mean you're gonna see it immediately, but over time it will show. So in terms of solutions, the best thing to do would be to avoid or limit exposure to excessively loud sounds, to turn down the volume of music systems that are too loud, uh, moving away from the sources of loud noises if it's possible, great. 
protecting children who are too young to protect their own ears. So especially babies, they make a lot of over the ear headphones now. Um, using those hearing protection devices when it is not feasible to avoid the exposure. Um, and making your friends, family, and colleagues aware of the hazards of noise. And if somebody thinks that they have a problem, the best thing to do would be to seek a hearing evaluation by a licensed audiologist or other qualified professional to be evaluated to see if that is a potential concern for them. And on this slide, this is just a little something for me, but typically people don't know how to put earplugs in correctly. Um, I've tested this out in clinic. I've tested it out at health fairs. I've asked people to put earplugs in. And if you see my smaller picture on the bottom of the screen, most of the earplugs look like the very first one that's considered to be an inappropriate fit, which is they just pulled the earplug out of the package and tried to shove it in there. It's not how it works. So on the back of the packaging for earplugs, it'll actually tell you the best way to insert earplugs is to roll it nice and small between your fingers and then to take your opposite hand and pull on your ear while you push it in and then to hold it in place with your finger to make sure that it gets nice and deep. And if you look at the bottom diagram of the picture on the left, you can see how it sits nice and flush with the opening of the ear canal. That's the best protection that you can get from an earplug. So with that, I'm actually going to pass it over to Gregory Scott, who is the founder of Soundprint. So he can tell you about his app that can also help you avoid um, noise exposure. Hi, can you hear me? Yep. We, I can hear you. Okay. We can, we can hear okay, you. Perfect. We can't see you. <laughs> okay. Let me um, share. Coming through. Okay. Thank you. Uh, that was a wonderful uh, introduction. Uh, very educational. Um, so I'm going to go through uh, and introduce you to what Soundprint is. In the interest of time, I may speed through some of these uh, slides, but just wanted to give you the overall flavor flavor of what Soundprint is. And so just to give you the backstory, I have hearing loss uh, that I got when I was 11 months of age. So it wasn't caused by noise-induced hearing loss, but many people have noise hearing noise-induced hearing loss, and um, I live in New York City and I was dating. And uh, when I was trying to find a venue to meet up in, I always wanted to find a place that was quiet enough for conversation. And so Soundprint started uh, in a quest for love, I say. And I would go to Google and I would search for quiet places in New York City. And then uh, what ended up happening is when I did find a quiet place, most of the times it was too loud for conversation and it made connection very difficult in general. Um, and like this photo here, can, you can attest to. And so what is Soundprint? So basically, uh, I created an app that helps uh, the public cloud for sound level venues that can enable people to find quieter places and avoid noisy ones. It's been dubbed in the media as Yelp for Noise. And um, you know the first stage of Soundprint is to collect as much data from venues as possible um, to, so we know which ones are quiet, which ones are noisy. And then the second stage is to work with venue managers to help educate them, uh, make them aware to monitor and improve their sound levels and to do something about the sound levels to protect their employees' hearing health and their patrons. And then we also provide data to acoustic-related professionals such as noise pollution advocates hearing health professionals, acoustic designers, and engineers, and we share our data with the World Hearing Forum. Uh, I'm gonna skip this uh, video in the interest of time, but basically the app function is to do two things. Uh, we keep it very simple, uh, make it as easy as possible for the lay user. And so the first thing a user does is they take a measure, you open up the app, and the first screen is deductible um, 
repeater that you see that's been calibrated across uh, multiple phone devices. You press start, and then you can rec you find a you wait at least 15 seconds for the app to measure the sound level that you're in. You tag the venue that you're in, and then you can recommend the place to a quiet list, or you can submit a noise complaint. And so that's really the uh, the measurement process. And then the second uh, function of Soundprint is simply to search venue by noise level uh, based on all the submissions that the public has done. Uh, so I'm going to play the screen. Hopefully, the sound will work. Uh, Soundprint to measure and submit sound levels with our decibel meter to find out if a place is good for conversation and safe for hearing out. Then search for venues worldwide based on how quiet or noisy they are. Let's get started. On the sound check screen, tap start and measure for at least 15 seconds. Want to measure like a pro? Hold your phone in the air, away from the surfaces and voices. Next, submit your sound measurements. Find your venue on the list and submit sound check. Want to add more insights about your experience? Here are the places you have for conversation, recommended as sound quiet place, or if it is fully occupied. Submitting your measurements to the sound soundtrack to the app's database it helps others see which places are quiet or noisy. This is how you contribute to the hearing health measure. Found a great spot? Share your find on social media with friends or review sites. If you don't see your menu on the list, manually create one using the plus. With your venue unusually loud, submit a noise complaint. Soundprint reaches out directly to the venue with friendly recommendations on reducing or optimizing noise levels. Soundprint does not mention who submits the noise complaint. Don't worry. Track your contributions to the quiet mission on the submission tab. Looking for quieter places to go to or noisy places to avoid? Use Soundprint's search function and filters to find places by location, sound levels, venue categories such as restaurants, bars, or gyms, or ratings. If you are located in an area without sound effects, the map will show black tents. Be the first to add submissions to your area. Join us at our mission to make the world a little quieter, one place at a time. So that was just an introductory video. And um, the next thing is to, to talk about the key benefits. It's basically, it's a decibel meter that's been calibrated across different devices. Uh, so you get consistent and accurate level measurements across different iPhones and certain Android Samsung models. Uh, the data is publicly accessible. It's easy to use and intuitive. And as I mentioned before, the goal is to incent them manager to optimize the acoustics for improve uh, dining or entertainment issues or to be in compliance with noise ordinances. And it's also used for individuals to measure the environment they're in to see how loud it is to protect their own hearing health. Um, the advantages of using SoundTrend is that, you know, we all, many people have smartphones and they become very prevalent. They're easy to carry around. It's very easy to whip out your phone, you know, whenever you're out, whether it's a restaurant, a bar, a coffee shop, take a 15 second measurement, submit it, um, and then it increases the potential for large sets of data to raise hearing health awareness with noise pollution advocates, hearing health researchers, anything that, any firms that are related to the acoustics industry. And um, the two uh, important features is, is we want to promote quieter venues so that, you know, patrons can visit them that are good for conversation and to protect their hearing health. So as you saw in the video, you can nominate quieter restaurants to be accessed by the public and they're more prominent in the search results. And it'll help promote the quieter venues and reward the managers with uh, more patrons. And then the other thing is uh, the user-based noise complaint where the user can, uh, when they make a noise complaint, where we have a process on the back end that automates uh, sending out uh, a notification to the venue manager with tips on stuff that they can do to uh, mitigate or optimize their acoustics. And um, just wanted to mention that the 
make sure to work with the restaurant to optimize or improve their acoustics. It's not to call them out. We don't report them to the government. There's none of that going on. And uh, just, you know, sound from success. Um, I mentioned that to show that people do care about their stuff. Uh, they care about sound. They care about noise. It's just that before the advent of the iPhone, there really wasn't technology that really helped people feel empowered to do something about it, whether it was to protect their own hearing health, whether it was to approach a venue manager and show them exactly how loud something is. So we have over 170,000 users, 140,000 submissions, uh, organic growth in the U.S., Europe, Australia, more. Um, every time a city has enough uh, amount of submissions, we will analyze that city and come up with a curated client list of restaurants, and you can access this on the app or the website. And again, you know, the media picking up on this, a lot of times the journalists will, will respond saying, I've never had such uh, engaged user response from an article I've done. And so that's um, a reflection of the media that picks up a lot of the stories about on-prem and noise pollution in general. Um, just some quick stats. Just, just, I get a question a lot about who uses the app. You know, most people thought it'd be just really baby boomers and older, but that's not true. It's very consistent across multiple age groups from those in the 20s, 30s, 40s, 50s, and 60s. And, um, you know, I initially created the app to help those with hearing loss find by other places, but most users of the app actually have normal hearing and they use it for um, behavioral situations, such as a date, a business meeting, or a family dinner. And then, um, so most of our marketing has been approaching uh, restaurants and bars and coffee shops, but the app covers every type of venue from retail stores, gyms, arenas, churches, event spaces, industrial settings, and, um, for example, we have a lot of data showing exactly how loud the spinning classes are or how loud a football stadium can be. And uh, when people inquire about that data, we share it with them. Um, this is just uh, more proof from the media that uh, the public cares about hearing. Uh, Zagat's annual survey shows that among diners, noise is often the number one and number two complaint in major cities. Here's more sample of the press we've gotten. Um, just a quick data use case. Uh, people think that there's no quiet restaurants available anymore. And um, before we go into that, the way Soundprint uh, categorizes sound level, the objective sound level measurement into four categories. One is quiet, that's anything below 70 decibels, moderate, which is feasible for conversation between 70 to 75. Loud is difficult for conversation between 75 and 80. And then very loud, is anything above 80, very difficult for conversation, but also endangers the hearing health. Um, so is it true? Uh, are there no more quiet restaurants? And we did a, a study of three, more than 3,000 New York City restaurants and bars, and the results show that um, there actually are quieter spots. Um, I would look at the 6% uh, the of restaurants, and typically those probably with hearing loss, it's best for them. So there's not that many for those with hearing loss or sensory disorders. However, for those maybe with normal hearing and want to protect their hearing health, um, still have a conversation. It's 23 plus 6, so it's 29% of restaurants, but only 10% of bars. So it's still a low number, uh, but what's really uh, intriguing is the data that shows the percentage of venues that are endangering the, endangering the hearing health of uh, patrons and employees, and this is where noise-induced hearing loss comes in, and that's 31% of restaurants. Uh, I wouldn't have expected the number to be that high for restaurants. For bars, I'm not that surprised. It's about 60%. So there's, very, uh, there's a lot of power in the data that's being collected and being submitted by users to really raise hearing health awareness to prevent noise-induced hearing loss. Um, and just a quick few slides. Why should venues care about acoustics? It plays a huge role in the patron sensory and dining experience. It can affect the enjoyment of food and drink. Um, but also, noise can put diners in a worse mood than they otherwise would have been. You know, the prior presentation talked about this noise or, um, you know, unwanted sound can elicit stress and anxiety response. It's frustrating socially to 
be able to connect with people without having to raise your voice and join the neck. Um, so, you know, um, restaurant review sites and critics are increasingly reporting on sound level, which is a very good sign. And um, also, uh, excessive noise can impact venue manager's bottom line. Um, while protecting the um, employee hearing health, if they you know, pay more attention to noise. And also, somebody else brought up this point that in COVID, noisier venues can cause people to speak louder, therefore, therefore raising risk of COVID transmission. So um, that can be done to optimize the acoustics. It doesn't always need to be uh, reduced to being quiet. A venue can be loud and exciting and still optimized for acoustics and conversation. Danny Meyer, uh, a well-known restaurateur here in New York City and elsewhere, very uh, well-known for paying attention to acoustics and the initial design of his restaurant and continues to get very high favorable ratings uh, from diners who go there. Um, and so uh, this is just a slide to venue managers about ways to optimize the acoustics to mitigate the noise. I won't spend too much time on this. Um, but this is something that we would send to uh, the venue managers when um, users make noise uh, complaints or places when measured is too loud. And so that's just very a quick introduction to what Soundprint is. If you have any questions, feel free to email at greg at soundprint.co. And uh, very happy to be presenting here. That concludes that. Thank you. I'm going to turn. We have a question for Dr. Brennan. So I'm going to reflect it back to her. And she is going to address the question. And if anybody has any questions, please submit them through the chat. Okay. So the first question I got is what is your opinion about the EPA recommended noise exposure limits, which is a 70 dBA daily average? And it's tough. It's tough to be under that limit for an entire day. Um, in truth, you're probably gonna have at least one point in your day somewhere that goes above that, which kind of brings down your exposure level for the day. Um, but I would say that society is trying to make an effort in a lot of situations to try to contain the noise. Um, if you see the paneling that they have on highways, those are set up to block some of the sound waves from the road noise before they hit houses and apartments that are nearby highways. Um, a lot of places that have loud noise exposure, such as concerts and things like that, do offer earplugs and other ear protection for people to use while they're there. Um, but I think it is also really hard to stay under that limit because of how active our lifestyles are. We really do travel far more than, than you know, even 30, 40 years ago, though a lot of people commute further than they ever thought they would before. Um, we have our phones, of course, which have changed over time and gotten louder and louder and we use them more. And I don't know about you guys, but I probably spend a large part of my day talking on my phone. Um, and it's difficult, I would say, to maintain the average that was set. In, in truth, I wonder if they will actually reevaluate at some point in the next five years. Periodically, um, people like the EPA and OSHA will look at those limits and reevaluate them and say, okay, well, where should we be now based off of all of the other things that we get exposed to? It was a really great question. Thank you. Okay, the next question is for Greg. Yeah, uh, thank you. And the question is, have you presented these findings? I presume it's the findings that I'm talking about. This question is asking about to any restaurant association. We presented to um, or have contacted different trade associations. The restaurant association, uh, the national one, we've not been able to get uh, in front of. I've been having uh, trying to get find out of contact if anybody knows of someone in the National Restaurant Association that'd be supremely helpful. I've spoken to plenty of uh, 
restaurant uh, managers or chain owners, and surprisingly, a lot of them are very uh, transparent and frank about the noise. They're not aware sometimes of how loud the noise levels are, um, or they just openly acknowledge that it is too loud, but they just didn't think that they could do anything about it. And when I've spoken to them, I said, here are some small things you can do about it. I put them in touch with certain acoustic suppliers, and so it's worked out for them. A lot of it is just them being unaware. We've also um, have um, expectation to uh, talk to various associations, such as uh, the movie theater association. We've had several users who take a lot of measurements of movie theaters, so they give very good data on that. Spinning classes is another. Um, churches is another. Um, it, it's the scope of venue types that are eligible or available for us to talk to is just massive. So there's a lot of trade associations we can talk to. Thank you. Are there any other questions? If anyone has any other questions, um, they can submit them in the chat and they will be addressed shortly. If not, um, I would like to thank Dr. Brennan and Greg Scott for joining us today. Um, if anyone has any questions about the presentation, the SoundPrint app, please feel free to email info at earrf.org and we can get any information you need. Um, all right, well, thank you and have a great day, everyone. And thanks for joining. Thank you. Thank Bye -bye. you.